how many of you would raise your hands and say, I really would like to grow in my relationship with Jesus? Can I see your hands? Okay. I figured there would be quite a few of us that you're serious about this. You really, you want to know Jesus better. You want to become more like him today than you were yesterday, last week, last month, or maybe ever. This is something you take seriously. You want to mature and develop and be everything that he wants you to be. Truth of the matter is, maybe you not only want that, you might already feel like you know exactly how that happens. A lot of people are convinced, although they have different answers. I mean, what do you need to grow spiritually? How does that happen? You know how some people whittle this down, truthfully? I don't know if it's any of you, but some people think, if I want to grow spiritually, here's what i got to do. i just got to stop doing bad stuff. Right? Just stop. They, they understand sin is the fundamental problem in anybody's life, and sin makes us do bad stuff. So if you can stop doing, if you can just stop being naughty, stop being naughty, stop doing bad stuff, and start doing good stuff, and you're going to be well on your way. Everything's going to be fine. It's that simple. But it's not exactly that simple, is it? No, it's not at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes that's a lot easier said than done for sure. Just like the Apostle Paul, maybe some of you, maybe you, some of you might say, you know what, I don't, I don't ever intend to do bad stuff. I don't want to make awful choices. I don't want to turn my life into a train wreck. I don't want to, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 7, if you just want to write that down, if you're taking notes. He's talking about this, and he says this, he says, you know, there are times that I really want to do the right thing, and I just, I don't. And there are times that I don't want to do the bad thing, and I find myself try as I might, I sometimes find myself doing the very thing that I hate. Now that's the Apostle Paul. If Paul has those moments where he doesn't always get it right in spite of how much he wants to get it right, chances are you might have those times too, amen? For sure. So here's what it comes to. Just being determined to stop being naughty doesn't always do the trick, right? It's a lot more complicated than that. There's more to it. So, so there's another group of folks that would say this. They would say, you got to look deeper than just the behavior. You have to look behind the behavior and see what is giving rise to it. What, what's causing this behavior? Where is it coming from? That's what you got to look at. And honestly, there's some truth to that. They, they will say, you gotta, you got to ask yourself if there's some things in your past, for example, that that are inhibiting you from growing like you want to grow in the present. They'll say, look, in your rearview mirror, do you have hurts and frustrations and, and failures? And if you do, man, you got to explore all that and, and see if you can come to some reconciliation and some healing. And then you'll be fine. Again, there's, there's a measure of truth to that, for sure. But is that all? Or is there more? Still other folks contend that the real problem, really, is you just don't have enough biblical truth in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit, because this is how they wheel it down. If it really is the things that we think about, and it really is the things that we dwell on and chew on in our minds that end up giving rise to our behaviors and our attitudes and our actions, whatever they may be, then... Well, the obvious answer, they believe, is just fill up your mind and heart with good stuff. Think about good stuff all the time, and then automatically good stuff is going to come pouring out of you. They will say, you just got to read and study that Bible more. You got to memorize more, tons of scripture, stuff it all in, and the more you do that, the more you will develop and mature. And, and they're actually coming from somewhere. They get some of this stuff from the Bible. I mean, didn't the psalmist, for example, say, didn't he say, Lord, I'm hiding your word inside. I'm going to fill up my heart, my head, my spirit with your word so that I'll stop sinning. <laughs> or at least as much. That's in the Bible, right? We also know this from God's word. If you are bound up by sin habits, addictions in your life, the Bible says it is, it's what that sets us free. It is the truth that sets you free. And where do you find truth? Not a trick question. In the Word of God. So, so the answer, 
many people would say, is found in just getting more and more scriptural truth and principles stuffed into your head and your heart, and you will be growing in no time at all. And I see what they're saying. Please don't miss it. There are several places I don't want anybody to misunderstand me, and this is one of them. Because truthfully, I, I understand there is life-changing power in the Word of God. I've seen it in my own life. There is power to transform my thoughts, my attitudes, my motives, my actions, how I treat. I know that to be true. I've seen it happen in my own, my own life. Then again, how many of us here know people in your life, if they're sitting next to you, don't point at them, please. But how many of us here know people that, that man, they've got an incredible command of the Scripture? They know the Bible inside and out, maybe better than anybody here in this room today, right now. And yet this person, whoever this is, just can't seem to get past that one thing that keeps haunting them. They just can't seem to get over that, that one hurdle that seems controlling in their lives. They're trying to follow Jesus. They're, they're trying to grow and develop spiritually, but man, this one thing just keeps haunting them and tripping them up every time. How many of us know people, they can not only quote the Bible backwards and forwards, but they can give you the Greek and the Hebrew definition of every word from cover to cover. It's just the problem is they're not living much of it. They're still mean as a snake. <laughs> they can quote more scripture verses than anybody you can name, and still they're arrogant. And they're critical, and they're jealous, and they're, they're, they're not living any of it. They know it. They can quote it. But you don't see it in their lives. I, I thought this was interesting. And all this, this just tells me there has to be something more than just a head full of biblical knowledge and truth. Because that's not always going to spur the growth that you need. Henry Cloud wrote a, a great book called How People Grow. A fascinating book. It's one of the best books on spiritual growth I've ever read. If you're a reader, you might want to pick it up. In this book, he's a counselor too, and, and he's talking about some of his counseling experiences in the past, and he says this. He says, I would teach people about God's love, but their depression wouldn't go away. And I would teach them about the crucified life, you know, crucifying yourself, saying, denying your selfish desires, but their addictions would remain. They would focus on their security in Christ and how secure they are in their relationship with Jesus, and yet their panic attacks would be unyielding. And he says, I would be very discouraged by this, and I don't blame him. And I understand. I get that as a pastor, and, and truthfully, I'm going to say this. I know in, in some of these particular situations that he, men, he mentions, there may be some mental health issues going on. That's, that's very understandable that it happens, but sometimes it's not mental health issues. Sometimes it's a discipleship issue. Sometimes it is something, there's something missing in the discipleship experience of this, of this particular individual. And, and, and you see it because they're getting the word. This, these, some of these people that he's writing about, they, they were getting an understanding of the truth and yet they still weren't growing. So what's the deal? Well, I... I know what it is. They just need prayer. They need to, this was the, this was a big emphasis in many of the churches where I grew up, the church culture. If you were trying to get to the next level in your spiritual growth, if you're trying to get past some of the habits and the hang-ups and the hurts of the past, and some folks would just say, all you got to do is come down to this altar on Sunday morning and we will slap our hands on you and we will pray for you and bam, everything will be better just like that. You just come down and get a good zap by the Holy Spirit and man, boom! Everything's going to be fine from here on out. Now, listen to me. This is another one of those places that please don't misunderstand me. Please don't hear something other than what I am hearing, what I am saying because I believe in the power of prayer. 
I believe in, in the, the, the prayers of faith when we're praying for one another and asking God to deliver or heal or restore or strengthen. I myself have experienced moments of radical breakthrough, life-changing transformation simply in a moment of somebody laying their hands on me and agreeing with me in faith that this mountain is going to move or I'm going to get past whatever it is I'm struggling with and I have seen it happen in an instant. Don't walk out of here misunderstanding what I'm saying. I've also seen this, though. I've seen way too many people come down for prayer time and time again on Sunday, have a legitimate, I mean, explosive experience with the Holy Spirit and yet turn around and walk out the door and still not see a whole lot change. So how do you explain that? I don't know how, if I can explain it always, but I know I can explain it this way sometimes. The problem is there were other things that also needed to change in that person's life. It didn't diminish the power or the activity of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Not at all. It's just that there were other things. Because listen, prayer can be an ingredient not just a breakthrough and transformation, but the spiritual growth. It really can. So, so can be all of these other things that I mentioned. Look, I know, because I, 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 as a pastor, I talk to a lot of people. And I hear a lot of stories. And so it may be, this may be true for you. There are people, maybe even in this room right now, who are biting and scratching and clawing and doing their best to stop being naughty. They're doing everything they can. And they're, 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 they're asking for, for prayer and they're reading their Bibles and they're exploring their past and trying to get through all of those issues. They're doing all the spiritual activity. They're getting some serious spiritual exercise. And still something is, is, is off. Something is, is missing. Man, you, you might see all this spiritual activity and think nobody is spiritually more healthy than him. Nobody's more spiritually active because, again, he prays all the time. And she reads her Bible five hours a day. And she gives her tithes. And they serve in this ministry and that ministry. And like we talked about last week, on occasion, they will even break down and bring some chocolate chip cookies to the pastor. And all of that is good. Especially the part about the cookies. All of that will help you. I'm telling you. But here's the question. Just having a bunch of spiritual exercise in your life, is that always the total answer and there's nothing? Else? Well, let me ask it to you like this. Is physical exercise the only thing, the only thing you need to grow strong and healthy physically? You just exercise and that's it? Is that the only thing you need? Anybody? No, you're not quite sure. How many of you exercise? How many of you like to, like to work out? Okay, I, I actually I asked that the wrong way. I ask you, if you like to work out. How many of you go ahead and you work out anyway? You hate it. But you go ahead and you work out anyway because you know that if you don't, you are going to turn into a gigantic blob of human goo. Anybody, you know, this is why. This is why you do it. All right, that's good. But is it enough? Some of you know the answer to that question, right? You work out all you want. You can go to the gym. You can run, you can walk, you can bike, you can lift weights, you can swim. Our ladies, the ladies here at Morningstar, meet here every other Saturday. Is it this Saturday too? Quick commercial. Ladies, you want to come out? I don't know what time it is because they don't let me come. 9 a.m. yoga. Yeah, they get serious. You can come to that and I hope you will. I also hope though that you will understand that there is more to it than that. Because you can work out like crazy, man. You can have your tail in the gym every morning at 5 a.m. pounding that body. If you are also laid up on the couch at 10 p.m. every night pounding the Doritos. <laughs> and the salt and vinegar chips and the gigantic bowls of ice cream. Guess what else is going to get gigantic? I didn't say it. But you know, you're going to be frustrated. Why? Because you don't have the whole picture. you got part of the picture, and it's a very important part of the picture, but you're missing a step. You're leaving something out, a key essential to physical health and growth. People do this spiritually all the time. they got all kinds of spiritual exercise in their life. 
Lots of spiritual activity. They work out like crazy, but there's something missing. They are also not working in a healthy diet of community and spiritual friendship and connectedness, and inevitably they too are frustrated because they're not growing in all the ways that they really want to grow. Let me get back to something that I said last week, some, something that may have surprised you when I said it, but I'm going to say it again. I just want to rephrase it, in fact, this time. And here it is. You cannot grow to maximum spiritual maturity with minimal spiritual connectedness. You just can't. You can try it, and people try it all the time, but you cannot grow to maximum spiritual maturity with minimal spiritual connectedness when you have no deep-level, life-giving relationships in your life. Now, I know people disagree with me that all the time. A lot of world religions, in fact, see this very very differently. They, they think quite the op opposite, in fact, that the most spiritually mature among us, the ones who are the most righteous, holy individuals, these are the ones who squirrel themselves away in monasteries or caves, or they travel way up to the top of the Himalayas all by themselves, right? Those are, those are the really the most holy people of all because they have removed themselves, I guess, from this evil world and they're not going to get stained by the rest of us unwashed masses. masses. They're not going to catch the sin cooties from any of the rest of you because they're separate. I, I, I have followers of Christ who argue this with me and they say, I don't believe that at all. I have conversations with people all the time. Perhaps you do too. They say, Tony, I don't need church. You heard this? Maybe you've thought it before. I don't know. I don't need church. I don't need to go on Sundays. I don't need to go on Thursday nights to the Connection Group. I don't need that. Here's what they say. All I need is, anybody know? Jesus. That's all I need. And that's true to a point. Because are you asking me what... What do you need besides Jesus to have forgiveness of sin and have eternal life and to be justified and to be made righteous in the eyes of God? That's all you need is Jesus, nothing more, thankfully. All you need is Jesus to have a relationship with God and to go to heaven and spend the rest of your eternity with him there. My question is, what about the time up until then? What, what about... What about growing in your walk with God from now until that moment? What about growing to be the person he wants you to be? Well, all I, all I need is Jesus for that too. Funny thing, not even Jesus would say that. That that's all you need? Not even Jesus himself. Look, look this is where you might be missing something. This is where I think a lot of people in our day and age more and more, unfortunately, are missing something. Because for all of its imperfections and warts and in ways that it doesn't measure up to some people's standards, and I understand the complaints about the church, but for when we understand in the Bible, the church is still the body of Christ here in this world. It, what does that mean? It means it is the physical representation and manifestation of, of him in this world. And so you just think about this. If I am disconnected from that, if I'm not in any way connected on a regular basis with the body of Christ, can I reasonably say that I am connected all the way 100% with, with Christ himself? Because he's the head of the body. That's what the word teaches us. R really, think about this. If you say you are connected with Christ, who's the head of the body, but you are totally connected, totally disconnected with the body of Christ, how does that work? My, my contention is that it doesn't. Over and over again, you see that it doesn't. I, again, I have these conversations with folks. We discover that without any regular and meaningful community with fellow followers of Christ, it breaks down. And at worst, at worst, you are risking a lot. You are risking seeing your attitudes begin to sour. You are risking having your thinking start to change and shift and look a little bit more like everybody around you out in the world. Your, your, your values begin to change. Your character starts to crack. Maybe your faith even crumbles. There are plenty of people. 
plenty of people who have eventually turned their backs on God entirely and listen, listen, it is not because they were bad people. It's because they were disconnected with the body. And sooner or later, look, you're disconnected with the body sooner or later. Many of them disconnect from the head of the body as well. They, they quarantine themselves, not realizing how much they really do need other people to keep on growing and keep on becoming more like Jesus. And by the way, please understand this. Saying that you need other people in your life is not a bad thing. Saying that you need other people in your life does not diminish God's role in your spiritual growth. As a matter of fact, other people playing a role in your life is part of his plan. This is how he set it all up in the first place. Ephesians chapter 4. This is somebody a lot smarter than I am. And in fact, I think he was anointed by the Holy Spirit when he said this. Paul the Apostle, he's talking about spiritual growth in this passage right here. Watch what he says in Ephesians 4.15. 4, he says, speaking the truth in love. I mean, right now, right there, if you're not in relationship with other people, how, who are you going to be talking to? Your imaginary friend. I don't know. <laughs> we gotta, we're going to be talking the truth in love to each other. So there, there, that suggests some connectedness right there. When he says... We will in all things, what's this word say? Grow. So he's talking about spiritual growth, right? We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, right? From him, so it, again, let's, let's all understand, it all flows still from him. He's the source of it all. But from him, the whole body then, what? Joined and held together. Not separate, not disconnected, not I'm over here and I never see you for months because we don't ever... Joined and held together by every supporting ligament, we will grow and then build ourselves up in love as what? As each part, you, 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 and you, are all, we're all doing our work. Are you seeing that? Coming together, pouring into one another's lives, encouraging each other, challenging one another, holding one another accountable, sharing what God is is speaking to us. Look, this is what it's saying. Ultimately, God is the one who is working in me. God is the one who is helping me grow. But this is what this passage is saying. Much of the time, he chooses to do that work through other people. He chooses, for whatever his own reasoning might be, to do that work through my relationship with others. As a matter of fact, this is the only way you're going to grow in some of the areas that are crucial to your walk with Christ. I'm going to give you several examples, okay? Here's one. How are you going to grow in patience if you are never, ever in relationship with other people who eventually, I promise you, are going to challenge that patience? You say, well, I got my children. Does that count? They will help you, I promise. But you see what I'm saying? Another example. How are you going to grow in kindness and unselfishness if you are out of relationship with other people? You won't. Because that selfishness just grows like a virus, like crazy in us, doesn't it? It grows like wildfire. And so one of the ways that I think God just beats that down is he puts us in relationship with other people that are going to test it and help us learn. How can you grow in forgiveness? And unconditional love. Listen, these are character traits that you have to develop if you are becoming more and more like Christ. This is the key, though. Where do they develop? I'm going to tell you where they develop. They developed in the context of community. Here's another one. How do you grow in wisdom? Oh, I got you on that one, Tony. Because I get all of my wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Yes. But again, how does that happen? I don't know. Sometimes he might give you, just download some wisdom in a time of prayer. He gives wisdom through his word. But there are other ways that God is trying to speak wisdom to you. I promise you, if you are listening, and again, 
make sure you're hearing what I'm saying. God is the ultimate source of all wisdom. Amen? Always. James chapter 1 says, if any of you need wisdom, all we have to do is go to God and ask him, and God will give it to us generously. It's always coming from him, but it comes in a variety of ways through a variety of, of sources. Listen, sometimes when God speaks wisdom into my life, and I know it's coming. Sometimes I will just know absolutely this is from him. This is a word of wisdom. Straight. This is coming straight from the voice of God. But I have to tell you, honestly, sometimes it sounds an awful lot like the voice of my wife, Heather. Amen, husbands. Sometimes it sounds, it sounds, a, I know it's, God's voice, but it sounds an awful lot like the voice of my dad, James Bird, who happens to be the wisest man I've ever known. Sometimes it sounds like, like the voice of friends that I have brought into my, lives to, my life to play this role, my staff members, our elders, these types of things. Because again, friends, this is, this is sometimes how it works. Through friends. Through relationships. I love the message paraphrase of Proverbs 13:20. This is great. You want to get wise? You want to get really, really wise? Read your Bible. That's great. Pray. Come to church. Do all these things. But here's another way. Become wise by what? By walking with the wise. You want to be wiser? Get around wise people. Get around other folks who are also connected with the source of ultimate wisdom. It's certainly better than the alternative, which is what? Hanging out with fools and watching your life fall to pieces. That's not what I would suggest. Here's the fact of the matter. There are some things that are only, you're only going to get, that are only going to develop in you in the context of relationships. There are some things, I believe this, that are only going to develop and grow in you in the context of life-giving relationships with other followers of Jesus. So, so if you're disconnected, then are you missing out? Another example, where do you find the comfort and the strength to grow through your pain? Is it your relationship, that you, the friendship that you've got with, with the, that gal who's an atheist at work? I'm glad you have a relationship with her. That's, that's right and good, but is, is she going to help you? Is that, that's the only real friendship you have in your life. Is she going to be the one that gets you through this moment in your life where everything is train wrecked? Where, where do you get that? Where, where, do you, where do you find the discipline to grow? in your life. I, I talk with people about this all the time too. I, I hear them say, you know what, I, I'm not, I've kind of stagnated. I stalled out in my spiritual growth. And now you know what I got to do? I just got to get some discipline, man. I got to start today and get some more discipline in my life. And I say, okay, where are you going to get that? Well, I'm just going to get it. I'm going to get all fired up and amped up and pumped up and I'm going to get some discipline and build it. Probably if you needed it, you would have already built it. You would have already created it. You would have already trumped it up if you could do that. I'm not quite sure it works that way. I'm not quite sure if this is not yet one more thing that sometimes might come through your relationships with others in the body of Christ. In that same book I mentioned earlier, Henry, Henry Cloud talks about this. He says this. This is a, this is a, a pregnant statement right here. I've been chewing on this for several days now. Get this first sentence. He says, self-discipline is always the fruit of other discipline. You want self-discipline in your life? We all need self-discipline in our lives. Yes and amen. It's always the result of other discipline in your life. He goes on to say, some people get disciplined by other people early in life, and then they internalize it into their character, and so maybe it's a little bit easier to to act on self-discipline sometimes because they possess it themselves to some measure. Other people, they don't get it. They don't get disciplined early in their life and they, they don't ever have self-discipline until they get it from others and internalize it for themselves. Look, he says, this is the way that God designed us to grow. 
other people discipline us, whether it's a parent, a coach, a teacher, dare I say an accountability partner, somebody that you know and love at church or in your connection group, who you meet with and pray with and, and study the scriptures with on a regular basis, and they're holding you accountable, yeah, it can come that way too. And he says, little, more and more and more, you're able to do this more and more yourself if you have somebody playing that role. We're going to talk more about accountability next week. I hope you'll be here. But is this making sense? It just keeps coming back to relationships, doesn't it? Over and over and over. This is why we talk about connecting in relationships and affecting change. There are lots of different types of relationships that we encourage, but with that purpose statement, connecting in relationships and affecting change, this is one of the reasons why, because this is a missing ingredient that so many people just like to skip right over in their walk with Christ, but it's an absolute must. If you're going to, I don't care if this is your first time ever in church or if you are the pastor of the church. I think a lot of people, if, if you've been following Jesus for long enough, you probably think, man, like this, stuff like these connection groups, this is probably just for the young Christians. This is probably just for the immature ones or the ones that are, you know, have these addictive behaviors or, or these compulsive behaviors. That, this is probably just for them. Wrong! Everybody needs connection with the body. Right, let me give you one more example. How do you grow in your grasp and understanding of the most basic building block of the Christian faith, which is the concept of grace? If you're not in relationship with other people. This, this is going to sound a little strange, I, I think maybe off the cuff for some of you, but I'm convinced that you cannot. You know what grace is? If I understand, grace, simple definition, grace is, is favor and goodness that you don't deserve. It is, it's grace, uh, grace is, is goodness and favor that I don't deserve. It is the one thing that breaks through the barrier of our sin condition and allows us to have the possibility of having a relationship with an infinitely holy God without grace. We are all doomed. Can we all agree on that? Okay. This is interesting though. Even with grace, aren't there still moments in your life from time to time where you still feel doomed? Have there, has there ever been? Let me explain it like this. You ever ask God to forgive you of something? That you, this is something that happened last week and you just really fell flat on your face. You really screwed up. Or maybe it wasn't last week. Maybe it was like three months ago. Maybe it was three years ago. Maybe it was 30 years ago. And you ask God to forgive you. As a matter of fact, you've asked God a million times to forgive you. And sometimes you actually feel forgiven, but sometimes you absolutely don't. And it's maybe not because you don't understand what Scripture has to say about God's faithfulness and His grace and His forgiveness. Maybe up here you do. Maybe you understand passages like John, 1 John 1 and 9, which says, If we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Great passage, and you might know it here. but still have trouble embracing it here and living it out every day of your life. You, you've got the head knowledge, but, but something's happening here. You've been exposed to the truth, but you're not totally experiencing the truth. And why does that happen even for people who've been following Jesus for a long, long time? Why? I don't know all the reasons, but I think this is one of the reasons. Grace is one of those things you can't totally understand until you experience it firsthand. And how do you experience the grace of God? Probably in a variety of ways, but this is one of them too. Same answer as before. Sometimes it's by receiving it through other people who are connected into your life. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. A few years ago, I was... I was leading a men's small group. It was a Bible study. Just a few of us getting together on a regular basis. We're just kind of studying the Word, praying together, growing in our relationships, kind of doing 
what we've been talking about. And one day, some guy just kind of spoke up. I don't even know what we were talking about, but he just kind of interrupted right in the middle. He said, look, guys, I've got to say something. I've got to say it right now. Because I, th I think if I don't say it, I am dying on the inside. And, and I don't know if I'm going to make it if I don't say it. And for the next 30 minutes, he proceeded to tell us about all of these sexual addictions in his life that were just keeping him captive, keeping him prisoner, and not only just beating him down. He was walking around with the guilt and the shame and the condemnation every moment of his life because he was pretty sure that God could forgive him for most of the stuff and the junk in his life, but probably not this because he can't get over the hump. He's sharing all this through tears. Grown man. And by the way, if you're picturing... I don't know what you're picturing in your mind as I tell you this story, but you're, if you're picturing some sexual deviant, you know, some, some filthy pervert, I don't know what you, how you see this. This is not this guy. Nicest guy you've ever met in your life. Love Jesus as much as anyone I've ever met. But he was struggling. It was really cool for me, honestly, as a leader of this group, to see what was happening as he started sharing. Just nobody, I didn't ask him to do this, but one by one, some of the guys of the group got up from their chairs. They came around him. They, they put their hands around him like this, and they just began to embrace him, and they began to pray. And about me, before he even got finished telling his story, man, before we knew it, we were praying. And I'm telling you, the power of God came down. This is why I'm telling you, I believe in the power of prayer, too. I really do. Because the Holy Spirit showed up in that place, and I'm telling you, started doing some radical things in his life. I knew it, but it wasn't until years later I was having a conversation with the same guy. He's been a longtime friend of mine, and he, he took me back to that moment. I'd totally forgotten about it, but he said, you know what? That was a life-changing moment in my life. And when I walked out of there, things were different for me. And I overcame all of those addictions in my life. But it wasn't just because of the prayers that you prayed. It was also because of the grace that you showed. Nothing wrong with the prayers. The prayers were part of it. But this is his own testimony. Because he said, I've been laboring under this, this cloud of guilt for years and years and years of my life, hearing about of God, a God of grace, but not really experiencing yet totally in my life. And yet it was still God's grace, but it was just flowing through you. And I tasted grace that day in a way that I had never tasted it before. Simply because I was connected. Connected. 